Hello, my name is Martin Nielsen. I am an equine veterinarian and with a particular passion for horses. I grew up with horses and horses is my life. And the last 15 years I've been working with parasites, parasite control, how to identify the best control programs and to develop better diagnostics, how to counteract or at least delay resistance development and how to de devise parasite control programs for the future. Welcome to this presentation uh, where we will review important and classic equine parasitic disease syndromes as you will find them described in many textbooks. But we will bring these up to date and talk about current presentations and also important treatment considerations. A lot of the topics that we will be talking about today will be covered in much more detail in this book, the second edition of Handbook of Equine Parasite Control, that I obviously recommend strongly. Uh, starting with uh, the Cyathlostomin parasites, or the small strongyals, uh, classically um, well known to be uh, causing disease in horses, especially uh, due to the insisted larval stage uh, that's uh, shown in this image. What we know about the condition is that it is extremely rare. Uh, we have to consider that essentially every single horse in the world uh, is infected with cyathostomin uh, parasites and a very, very, very small subset ever develop any signs of disease. So it's a high uh, prevalence but low morbidity uh, condition. Uh, we also know that the disease is associated with uh, specific larval states, as mentioned before, particularly the uh, process of egg assessment, where the larvae are actually leaving the mucosal wall to make it back into the intestinal lumen. The uh, syndrome is characterized by some classic symptoms, uh, certainly in the acute stage. Uh, we have the generalized uh, tiflocolitis. You will see... Uh, edema accumulating in the walls of these intestines. Uh, the horse will uh, have profuse watery uh, and protein-losing diarrhea, uh, sometimes bloody as well and, and with a bacterial superinfection. And in the acute uh, phase, uh, a case fatality rate of 50% has been reported. Uh, there's a one very nice um, epidemiological paper from the middle of the 1990s from the United Kingdom that identified risk factors for this disease. Uh, primarily, it's described in young horses. Uh, it primarily occurred occurs in the winter or early spring, and uh, horses typically are recently dewormed, uh, and by recently we mean within uh, 14 days prior to the onset of the event. Uh, there's some discussion as to whether there's a difference between using a, a non-larvicidal uh, anthelmintic, uh, such as, for example, ivermectin, compared to a larvicidal anthelmintic, uh, for example, moxidectin. Uh, whether the risk might be less with the larvicidal, I think there certainly are argu arguments that it should be, but we don't really have any strong scientific evidence that this is actually the case. Um, just from observations in recent years, uh, we, we continue to see cases, although at a very low rate in, in Northern Europe, Canada. Uh, I have heard about cases here in New Zealand. I don't think it's very common. Uh, in contrast, in most uh, of the United States, uh, there barely are any reports at all. Uh, Personally, I live in Kentucky, which has a very high concentration of horses and, and young horses. Uh, and despite that, uh, no one really ever sees this uh, disease there. So is there maybe a regional or climatic influence uh, that's possible? Again, we don't know. Um, also, there appears to have been a decrease in the occurrence of the disease, or if, if nothing else, a decrease in the number of case reports published. And, and this, of course, could have to do with the fact that, well, it got described, sort of discovered and described in the 1990s and uh, gained a lot of attention then. Several people started looking at it and publishing about it. And then, you know, the interest sort of oozed out and disappeared a little bit and people started working on other things. And so it may still be happening, but just be underreported. Or um, there may be just fewer cases occurring today comparing, compared to 20 or 25 years ago. Again, uh, we are not exactly sure. Just to review uh, here, we, we do have to do with 
uh, certain stages of the uh, life cycle, of the internal life cycle of this particular parasite. Um, it's, uh, it's important to just keep in mind that uh, we differentiate between the early L3, EL3 on this uh, slide, uh, the, uh, and then the LL3 and the L4 that are the developing but still insisted larvae as, as uh, illustrated by this, this box here. Um, what happens at the early L3 is that's where we see the arrested development. And this data from this paper from 2003 illustrate that there's an age effect there. So uh, ponies age one year old, the proportion of EL3s was 35. But as they got older, the proportion went significantly up, got twice as high. So this suggests that by uh, with increasing age, there is an accumulation of these stages, uh, rested development. So it might have to do with age-dependent immunity or continued exposure to incoming EL3s. Certainly, arrested development it does not occur uh, in foals uh, during their first grazing season, but it does occur occur in subsequent years. So this accumulation of insisted stages is believed to be a risk factor for uh, larval cyphostomenosis. The more larvae that you have uh, insisted in and arrested in the mucosal walls, the potential higher risk for the decision to for the disease to develop. Um, and so some climates with more pronounced climatic differences between winter and spring and summer and fall uh, may actually predispose animals to this condition. Again, this this is, this is primarily on the hypothesis stage at this moment. So once you have a condition uh, of acute level uh, cyphostomenosis with uh, diarrhea, um, horses are severely dehydrated, obviously, and fluid therapy is um, really the most important thing to do. And it's an uphill battle to just keep up with the level of diarrhea in these animals. It can be very difficult to rehydrate them. As mentioned before, they're also using, uh, they're also losing protein significantly. So restoring the osmotic balance is of utmost important and, and uh, plasma expanders, etc., uh, can be uh, used for that. <clears throat> This is often supplemented with anti-inflammatories, uh, antibiotics for the possible risk of secondary bacterial infection, and then the anthematic of choice, the drug of choice, is moxidectin these days. And for two reasons. First of all, we do not have any resistance reported to the larvicidal efficacy of this uh, compound, uh, and this is you know, in contrast to the five-day double dose of fenbendazole, which is the only alternative with larvicidal efficacy, and we have uh, resistance reported there and described. And uh, the other thing is that we now, in a whole series of studies, have evaluated the local mucosal inflammatory reaction to moxidectin and really basically uh, not found anything or found very subtle reactions. So, so moxidectin is safe and uh, uh, and it, effective and will remove a large proportion of the larvae and therefore um, reduce uh, further disease um, happening. The second parasite disease syndrome is parascris associated disease. We have a review paper published uh, in the past couple of years in equine veterinary education and and uh, you can uh, if you have access to this journal, I recommend reading it. Uh, this is made available to both uh, members of the AAEP and BIVA. So if you happen to be a member of any of those associations, you should have access to this journal. Um, just summarizing some of the things that are presented in that paper, uh, there is um, a number of cases reported over the years, actually covering three decades, uh, cases of small intestinal impactions with uh, parascris parasites in horses. And the three different case collections are summarized here. <clears throat> um, one from uh, North America, uh, actually two from North America, one from uh, the US and the other one from Ontario, Canada, and a more recent one from Israel. Um, in general terms, the uh, median age was five months uh, for two of the studies and 10 months in the Israeli study. So, so certainly confirming that we're dealing with foals or young yearlings. Um, typically, uh, the conditions happen in the autumn. Um, we don't think it's really uh, season dependent, it really reflects the age of the foals uh, in the autumn because, again, most foals will be uh, five months or thereabout uh, by 
summer, early fall, and depending on when they were born. So, so that's not uh, really surprising at all. And the majority were treated. Uh, we don't have that information for the Israeli study, but for the other two studies, we have uh, uh, anthelmintic treatment within 24 hours prior to the condition. Uh, and a number of different actors were used. The large uh, uh, majority of these had uh, a paralytic mode of action. And uh, that is believed to be a risk factor to use an effective uh, dewormer with a paralytic mode of action. Um, the uh, benzimidazole drug class here represented only once here in this table uh, with uh, fenbenazole. Um, has a different mode of action, does not paralyze the worms. Uh, actually, uh, it um, affects the metabolism and uh, starves the worms to death. So uh, a more, much lower onset of effect, and, and it is recommended uh, for treating uh, parascus parasites, also because we have very, very few reports of resistance to uh, benzimidazole drugs at this point. Uh, a little more information from those uh, three case collections. Um, some of them underwent surgery. Uh, those are the 37 cases uh, summarized here. Uh, some of them had some complications. Obviously, if you have rupture or volvulus or any of these, uh, that uh, complicates the case and decreases the uh, uh, prognosis for full recovery. Um, surgical procedures is, is sort of an ongoing discussion. This is not my expert area, so I'm not going to go uh, much into it, but there are really two approaches to take. One is to cut the intestine open and remove the worms and then uh, stitch everything together. And um, that is uh, obviously associated with risks of uh, adhesions and other uh, complications uh, down the road, but you are sure to more effectively remove the parasites. The alternative is to just milk uh, the worms uh, from the ileum where they typically are found when uh, when there's an impaction, and then into the cecum. Um, you don't cut the intestines open, it's less invasive, but then there is a microtrauma to the serosal surface of the uh, ileum, and that might also be associated with the risk of adhesions and uh, strictures uh, down the road. So again, it's an open discussion point, which is better, and uh, it also depends on whether other uh, complications are encountered. Survival um, stat statistics are, are actually quite interesting. Short-term survival was defined as uh, still alive or, uh, or, and dismissed, uh, so survived until dismissal from the hospital. Um, and out of the 37, uh, 30 of the foals actually did survive, so that was uh, pretty good. However, only 11 uh, we're still alive uh, one year uh, later, uh, one year after the surgery, and that is certainly uh, illustrating the point that uh, these foals can struggle um, for a long time after uh, a condition like this. So treatment considerations for uh, these impactions, uh, in most cases, uh, conditions are very painful in the falls and surgery will be required because of pain manifestations that are, are not controllable. And uh, when surgery is decided, it, you know, it's um, up to the surgeon to decide whether they think that enterotomy or milking would be the better approach as discussed uh, on the previous slide. However, there, there are also undoubtedly milder cases where pain manifestations can be controlled. And in those cases, medical treatment can be attempted. Um, and uh, of course, um, gastric reflux has to be monitored. That would be another inclusion criterion for uh, deciding for surgery. Um, and, and, and you have to be able to manage the pain manifestations as mentioned. Um, what we recommend is to administer mineral oil um, by a nasogastric tube, uh, certainly make sure that the foal is hydrated, uh, and then administer a benzimidazole, which in most countries would be a fenbenazole. In some countries, other benzimidazoles are available, but that is because of the metabolic uh, action that this uh, drug class has and a, a much slower onset of effect than a, a anthelminic with a paralytic mode of action. The foal will have to be monitored for a period of 24 to 48 hours 
uh, post-treatment for uh, worms um, coming out of the feces, but also uh, for gastric reflux, and sometimes you can actually recover worms through uh, the nasogastric tube. Tapeworm-associated disease is another important topic that we have recently reviewed in Equine Veterinary Journal, also in uh, 2016, so you can get more details there. Uh, like with the other review paper, we also have summarized a number of studies. Uh, here, a summary of all the uh, case control studies that have been done evaluating the role of equine tapeworms in various colic syndromes. Uh, whenever you see a number here in the odds ratio column, it means that a statistically significant uh, association was found between colic, the type of colic defined out here, and diagnostic findings of tapeworms, either as eggs in the fecal samples or elevated concentrations of anti-tapeworms uh, antibodies uh, with the ELISA method down here. And as you can see, there are actually are quite a few studies that did found and report a significant association. Uh, one thing these studies have in common is that for the most part, if you specify the types of colics to uh, being ileal impactions or ileocecal colics, uh, as described in several places, that's where you are more likely to see an association. Uh, when bread and butter colleagues, just all types of colleagues, were uh, analyzed, in very few cases were any significant associations noted. And so this just uh, speaks to the point that colic is not a diagnosis, it's a, it's a symptom complex and can be caused by many, many different things. Obviously, uh, tapeworms could be one of those uh, things. So, um, these uh, conditions can also be complicated in horses because uh, like with the small intestinal uh, ascorid impaction, we actually have the tapeworms located very close to the same area, uh, i.e. the ileum or right at the ileal, ileal cecal junction. So uh, hence the risk of ileal impaction, which is what we also see with the ascorids. Uh, <clears throat> and then in the susception and vagination uh, are findings that have been reported as well. And these obviously are surgical. Uh, they are very unlikely to recover uh, just with, a, with conservative treatment. Uh, however, in many cases, uh, and there are lots of claims around that uh, tapeworms can cause uh, mild recurrent colics, uh, spasmodic colics, and there's really, really very little evidence suggesting that this is actually the case. Um, one thing that in the uh, hospital patient version of colic, some of these down here that may even require surgery, anthelmintic therapy uh, is not on the top of your list, should not be. You have to manage the patient and, and get the pain manifestations under control, uh, rehydration, and basically see if you can take care of the colic. And once that horse is stabilized and over the colic, that's when you consider can consider uh, eliminating the remaining parasites that still uh, may still be there. Um, so, so just a little bit of a different approach compared to how you would handle, for example, uh, the ascorid impaction mentioned above. And a little bit about perhaps the most uh, classic parasite or parasitic disease, uh, which is the bloodworm Strongylus vulgaris, uh, infamous for and causing very painful colic uh, in horses and lots of descriptions in the textbook. Uh, a little bit of history about this parasite. Uh, it used to be highly prevalent. Uh, virtually every single horse would be infected. Uh, and this, this has been described uh, over a period of, of more than 100 years. Um, where uh, this was not the dominant parasite necessarily, but present in the large majority of horses when examined. Uh, in the 1980s, and this was after the introduction of several of the modern anthelmintic products that we now have, especially uh, ivermectin that was introduced in the early 1980s, um, 
researchers were noticing a change. And these two papers are uh, quite uh, famous for reporting the transition where um, the downshift of strontulus vulgaris was noted in that the cyathostomes that we just talked about earlier were now considered the more, most important pathogen, parasitic pathogen in horses. And, and the parasite strontulus vulgaris to the, today is now considered uh, extremely rare in managed horses and often goes completely undetected. However, um, research done by myself and, and as I will show you in a bit also by others have illustrated that if some of the treatment recommendations uh, that have been made in recent years to reduce anthelmintic treatment intensity and only treat horses exceeding a certain uh, parasite egg count level and leaving the remainder of horses untreated. If, if those recommendations are implemented very, very strictly, um, you will have a lot of horses that will essentially never get dewormed because they will have very low egg counts uh, every time they are checked. <clears throat> and those farms that uh, implement such strategies are uh, more likely to actually have strontulus vulgaris present. So what you have here in these two charts is a comparison between farms that base their treatments on fecal egg counts, all their treatments, and farms that don't. So these farms over here with the black columns will be treating all their horses at certain times of the year, whereas the farms with the white columns will be collecting a fecal sample from all the horses and then treating those that exceed uh, the uh, threshold, which is typically 200 eggs per gram, and only uh, those horses. And two different diagnostics, uh, the classic copper culture where larvae are identified under the microscope and then a PCR, um, uh, basically testing for presence of, of strontulus vulgaris. So what you notice is that the individual prevalence is uh, almost twice as high uh, on the farms that base their treatment decisions on fecal egg counts and leave some horses untreated compared to those that don't, even more pronounced on the farm prevalence uh, level. And the same uh, uh, picture was noted over here with uh, the copper culture. So the parasite can re-emerge and should not be forgotten is the take home from this study. Uh, although a reduced treatment intensity is desirable in, uh, in an attempt to reduce the uh, development of resistance in cyathostome parasites and now also in ascorid parasites, we should not forget that strontulus vulgaris is still potentially around and could be re-emerging. Um, other studies have been done in recent years also establishing the strontulus vulgaris uh, uh, prevalence in various different countries. The overall uh, pattern has been that in other northern European countries, it is very, very rare. Here's a study from the United Kingdom, several different German studies where they have investigated this very, very thoroughly and they find uh, very, very low percentages uh, overall. So this is not the risk of the re-emerging strontulus vulgaris parasite is not necessarily a risk everywhere. Uh, in Sweden, however, very recently um, they reported these findings with prevalences that were actually even higher than what we had in our Danish study. Now Sweden is our neighbor country in Scandinavia, so um, uh, they have prescription-only restrictions on anthelmintic products just like we have in Denmark and, and therefore very low treat treatment intensities and that may be the main explanation. So uh, the parasite today still causes disease and we have a collection of cases just published this year from uh, the University of Copenhagen teaching uh, veterinary teaching hospital. So 30 recent cases were described and characterized in this paper. Here are some pictures from one of those cases where you see the infarction that uh, this parasite can cause. Uh, what is interesting is that these patients uh, did not primarily present as colic patients. They were actually, um, they showed very mild colic symptoms or no colic symptoms at all. The primary presentation was actually peritonitis, which, can, which is understandable when you consider these devitalized sections or segments of the intestines where bacterial overgrowth can happen and then you get the, the, the crossing over to the uh, peritoneal, uh, peritoneal cavity. 
<clears throat> what's also interesting to note is that only three of the 30 horses uh, in this case collection survived the condition. Those three horses all survived because they underwent exploratory uh, surgery. And, and this is where these pictures were taken, taken and these uh, affected areas were resected and, um, and the horses actually recovered. <clears throat> the um, Several of the cases were uh, attempted to uh, be treated uh, medically and those uh, cases all uh, had to be euthanized. So, so horses with this condition, uh, if, if they ever should have a chance of surviving, they would need to undergo surgery. It's very unlikely that they would recover uh, with just medical treatment. And it's very, very important to identify the peritonitis as early as possible in the process. And, and the only way to do this is to perform an abdominus and uh, and get that abdominal fluid examined uh, as quickly as possible. We also did another uh, case control study, actually the first case control study for a strongulate parasite. Uh, and again, looked at various types of disease. Uh, we found a significant association between uh, these strangulating infarctions, uh, sorry, the non-strangulating infarctions and elevated concentrations of antibodies to the parasite in serum samples from these uh, horses. And the strangulating infarctions, uh, the lipoma uh, typically <clears throat> induced infarctions or, or torsions um, uh, volvulus of the intestine uh, were not associated with the parasites so again this sort of confirms what we expected and of course also when we compared to non colligate controls we had a significant association with a uh, non-strangulating infarctions so uh, once again, how do you handle a case? Uh, the medical treatment uh, is unlikely to be successful. Uh, the surgical intervention is required. Uh, it's the only way to really uh, provide a full assessment of the extent of the intestinal damage and to determine whether it, uh, <clears throat> it is even possible to resect the affected area. Um, and then, as mentioned before, the earlier the diagnosis uh, of the peritonitis, the better the chances. Uh, horses with peritonitis often show very mild uh, or no uh, real colic symptoms, and and you can be it can be tempting to just attempt um, a conservative approach. But uh, if in fact it is due to this condition, um, that's certainly not recommendable. So that finishes this. Uh, presentation on uh, equine parasitic disease. Uh, I do have a Twitter account uh, where I talk about these things. Um, a, all things equine parasitology really. So uh, if you happen to be on Twitter, um, you can follow me on this Twitter handle.